Europe opens its borders. The U.S. is cracking down again. And Brazil is bracing for the worst. Hi there. Thanks for joining us for Plain English Lesson number 276. I'm Jeff. JR is the producer. And you can find this full lesson at plainenglish.com slash two seven six. Coming up today, the world is in a strange spot in the coronavirus pandemic and the current status in three regions shows just how different things are in different parts of the world. Europe, is starting to open its borders to international travel. The U.S. is lurching forward and back in its reopening. And Brazil could be headed for the worst of the virus. In the second half of the lesson today, we'll talk about what it means to downplay something a word frequently used in connection with the virus these days. If you're a Plain English Plus member, you have a great video lesson today. It's about how to use the word supposed to. If you're not quite sure how to use he's supposed to or I was supposed to, then this is the video for you, and you can find that at plainenglish.com slash 276. As the coronavirus enters its seventh month in existence, three regions of the world are in distinctly different places. Starting with the most optimistic, Europe. The governments of the European Union agreed to begin letting travelers enter the EU, but only from countries that have gotten the coronavirus under control. Those countries include Canada, Australia, New Zealand, Japan, South Korea, and nine smaller countries. Chinese travelers may get permission soon, too. Notably missing are the United States and Russia, both of which lobbied hard to be on the list. EU ministers created the list based on the health conditions in all the other countries and based on economic ties. Spain lobbied to include Morocco on the list, for example, since the two are so close geographically. But the more important criteria were health-related. To make it onto the approved list, a country needed to have an infection rate close to or below that of the EU, and infections needed to be declining among other criteria. The new rule applies to the EU-wide border. All individual countries will have the opportunity to create stronger border controls if they wish. Italy has already decided it will not open its borders to travelers from outside the EU. The EU will revisit the list of countries about every two weeks. Although borders are starting to open up to travelers, the move guarantees that the economic effects will continue to be felt throughout the rest of the year. About 2 million Americans visit Europe on vacation each year between May and September, and it looks like none of them will be able to visit and spend money this year. 
America was absent from the list of permitted countries because while Europe is continuing to see a decline in cases, many U.S. states are suffering from a spike in cases. The U.S. is a large and diverse country, and many states have experienced the pandemic differently. Florida, despite its graying population, was not badly affected by the first wave. Other southern states like Texas were similarly fortunate. More rural states escaped without much damage too. But all that is starting to change. Once Florida started allowing businesses to open, the number of cases started to surge. The governor says it was because people became complacent. After it fell out of the news, he said Floridians were less careful. The virus started to spread, notably among younger people. Bars had opened, but Florida is in the uncomfortable position of having to reimpose restrictions. Bars are now only open to take out food, and Miami has a curfew from 10 p.m. until 6 a.m. The governor of Texas mandated that people wear face masks when they are in public buildings, a rule that he had previously resisted implementing. The state of Indiana is pausing its reopening plans. American states talk about their reopening plans in phases. Each state, confusingly, has a different number and definition of phases, but Indiana was supposed to move to phase five this weekend. Instead, the governor created a phase 4.5 where some restrictions on crowd sizes would remain. We are living on virus time, he said, acknowledging that the reopening will have to respond to the virus and its spread. Europe suffered badly from the coronavirus but appears to have managed its reopening well and has avoided a so-called second wave of infections. Many states in the U.S. appear to have mistimed their reopening plans and are suffering from a resurgence of the virus. The third region we'll talk about today, Brazil, may be reopening its cities at precisely the wrong moment. In May, a research team at the Federal University of Rio de Janeiro predicted that June would be the worst month of the pandemic. Despite that warning, the mayor of Rio de Janeiro started to relax restrictions on June 2nd. After a month, the death toll had risen by 70% over the previous month, and new infections increased by 50%. The reopening is continuing, however. Restaurants and bars are opening in Rio in July. Belo Horizonte is going in the opposite direction. It was one of the first Brazilian cities to enter and then emerge from a lockdown. However, its mayor recently ordered 
non-essential businesses to close again after seeing a spike in deaths and hospitalizations. He said that in Belo Horizonte, they aren't flat earthers, a not-so-subtle swipe at Brazil's president. Brazil does not have the luxury of strict quarantines the way Europe and America do. Its social safety net is not as strong, and its citizens have much less of a financial buffer. Missing work imposes significant hardship on a large portion of Brazilians who cannot work from home, the kind of hardship that most Europeans and Americans will never know. Brazil's president, Jair Bolsonaro, has downplayed the risk of the virus. When the pandemic started, he said that the quarantine and economic shutdown would do more harm than the virus. He was well outside the mainstream of opinion around the world, and even in Brazil when he started saying that. But many Brazilians are wary of the economic toll the virus is taking and are starting to agree with that message. Many people, especially those who run small restaurants and shops, are more afraid of staying home than of going out. The world is in an awkward position, with some regions having significantly reduced infections, others still alternating between optimism and pessimism, and others living through the virus's worst stages. Starting tonight, we are doing the first of our three webinars on the best technology for learning English in 2020. We're doing three of them tonight, Wednesday morning, and Saturday morning here in the U.S. The times are all localized to your time zone, so check those out on the homepage of plainenglish.com or on your dashboard if you're a free member. Today, we're going to talk about not an expression, but just a word, downplay. It's a verb, an action. When you downplay something You describe something as less than it would normally seem, or you describe it as less than it really is. Think of downplay as the opposite of the word exaggerate. We use downplay with a certain type of word. Let me give you some examples of words that go well with downplay. You can downplay risks. That's probably the most common. You can downplay danger. You can downplay costs. You can downplay importance, seriousness, things like that. So let's look at some examples with these words. Brazil's president downplayed the risks of the virus. When he was talking about the virus in public, he made the risk of the virus seem less than it truly was. Many people think that energy companies are downplaying the risk of climate change. Companies that invest 
in big projects during good economic times often downplay the risk of recession. They'd rather just think of the good times. You can downplay the seriousness of something. When the coronavirus first emerged, many Western governments downplayed the seriousness of the virus. It was just another virus to emerge from Asia. They said, it's not that serious. To this day, some people think China itself downplayed the seriousness of the virus because they didn't want to be embarrassed on the world stage. The important thing with downplay, though, is that you purposely, purposely describe something as smaller or less than it really is. Just being wrong doesn't mean you're downplaying something. For example, many people didn't think face masks were effective against the spread of the coronavirus. If you said that face masks were not an effective tool to stop the spread of the virus, you might have just been wrong. If you were wrong, you weren't downplaying it. To downplay something is to purposely make it seem less important or less big than it is. India and China recently had a skirmish at their border. A skirmish is like a small conflict. In this case, a number of Indian soldiers died. China downplayed the importance of the conflict. India was offended by the actions of the Chinese soldiers, but China chose to present this as no big deal. They downplayed it. Some people are not comfortable purposely talking about their own strengths and successes. Some people, this is true, downplay their own accomplishments even in job interviews. They don't want to appear to be bragging, so they do the opposite. They are falsely modest. That's fine in a conversation, but if you go into a job interview and everyone else is exaggerating their accomplishments, you don't want to be the only one to downplay yours. You don't want to be the only one to purposely talk too little about your accomplishments and your strengths. Today's quote of the week is by the Irish writer Lawrence Stern. He said, We don't love people so much for the good they have done us as for the good we have done them. That's a good quote, especially if you have kids. One more time, we don't love people so much for the good they have done us as for the good we have done them says the Irish writer Lawrence Stern. That's all today. Congratulations on making it to the end of today's lesson. I hope you are staying safe wherever you are. If you're in Europe, now is not the time to become complacent. Just be careful out there. That's my final word for the day. And remember, we are doing a webinar on the best technology tools for learning English in 2020. That is this week, today, Wednesday, and Saturday. 
check out the homepage plainenglish.com for the full schedule. And if you're listening after the week of July 13th, then don't worry, you can see a replay. Just go to the webinar section of the homepage and you can always see the replays we have available. We'll be back as always with another lesson on Thursday. See you then.